This video will contain heavy spoilers from the Call of Duty Modern Warfare series, both from the reboot and the original trilogy. You have been warned! The gameplay you see featured, unless otherwise stated, is from the YouTube channel Gamers Little Playground. When I played these games, I didn't record them because I didn't have the idea of this video at the time, and I didn't want to go through like 16 hours of content again. Call of Duty satisfies the female gaze, and that's why it's better than ever. I think but Call of Duty in 2022, we can all agree that it's in a great place. The graphics look fantastic, the visual fidelity is on another level, the multiplayer is attracting players back in their thousands with the launch of Warzone 2 and the DMZ mode. Even if unlocking some of the guns is a rather tedious experience. What the hell happened to just hitting max level and having all the guns? What the f*** is this? Infinity Ward, explain! But all of that aside, my theory as to why Modern Warfare 2 has been such a success and drawn an entirely new and different audience is more subtle and nuanced than the big explosions and the gunplay that is series defining features. Sure, all of those things are fun and ensure the longevity of the game when it comes to a prolonged multiplayer experience, but those things don't get new people into the game and attract thousands of new fans. The Modern Warfare reboot series satisfies the female gaze in a way the series has never considered. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think this was ever their intention, but the new campaign and the direction they've taken the game's story fulfill all the requirements for the female gaze all the same. Now I can hear the sad gamer boys in the back already screaming in the distance at me. Call of Duty is for us! It's not for girls! Get back in the kitchen! Yeah, 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 bro. I heard it all before. You'd think by now they'd have some new material. Listen up. Just because the game is appealing to other groups of people now doesn't mean the original audience cannot enjoy it. I think that's obvious enough. But before we go any further, let's have a quick discussion about the female gaze and what it is. The female gaze is something that is hotly debated today. The phrase was first coined as a response to the quote unquote male gaze, which was discussed by Laura Mulvey in her essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. In short, she theorized that the conventions established in classical Hollywood films required all spectators, regardless of their sex, to identify with the male protagonist and to adopt the controlling male gaze around which such films were held to be structured. However, the female gaze is not simply to turn that same gaze onto men. It's more complicated than that. You want to translate that from bullshit to English? Happy to do so, Gaz. The most famous example of the male gaze in action can be seen in Transformers, we all know the scene with Megan Fox bent over the car trying to fix what's wrong with the engine. As she and Shia LaBeouf are talking, all we see are close up shots of Megan's body, her face, but not what she's doing in the car. And her character is supposed to be like a car nut and know how to fix it, but we wouldn't know that from this scene. And that's what I'm talking about when I say the camera is literally showing us Shia's male gaze. The female gaze is more ambiguous. I think Jane Soloway put it best in her masterclass. I think the female gaze might be a way of feeling, seeing. Okay, so it can be thought of as a subjective camera, one that attempts to get inside the protagonist. It uses the frame to share and evoke a feeling of being in feeling rather than looking at. The, characters. the female gaze is not about objectification, but rather the personification of the characters we see on our screens. Listen to what the narrative director had to say about writing the characters in the reboot. I mean, the, the, the war genre in general, it's a source of pressure yeah. for characters, right? You know this better than anyone, that, that pressure oh. <laughs> reveals character. Mm -hmm. And that's what we try to put our, our characters under, is under yeah. pressure so that they're forced to evolve. They're forced to overcome that obstacle and get out of their comfort zone. And so for us as creators to work in that genre, that's part of making Call of Duty, and to not only empathize with characters who are put under pressure and have to reveal their, their true nature and to be forced to make those kinds of choices. The point he makes about the characters having to reveal themselves and evolve under pressure just hits the female gaze on the head. It's not just about Ghost being a cold badass, it's showing us that underneath the mask he's a man and a person 
Chris feelings. One of the reasons I think that this game is this, this version of this game has resonated so well is because you know you've really got three dimensional characters like <laughs> blossoming here because you you're figuring out that as is true of human beings yeah that you know nobody is like a hundred percent on edge or a hundred percent serious or a hundred percent anything that people are complicated. Have you guys ever heard of the looking respectfully meme? That is the female gaze. So what's all of this got to do with Call of Duty? Well, after playing through Modern Warfare 1 and the Modern Warfare 2 reboots, I went back and played through the original trilogy. Yes, boys, I'm a COD4 veteran player. I have been around the block. I remember Augie lead up. I got yelled at on Xbox Live for being a girl. But I think one thing we missed when we were playing back then was just how much of the franchise was the male power fantasy and not much else. Did you guys ever notice that when the player is in control of the protagonist, they never speak during any of the missions? Doesn't that seem weird in a military shooter? Are you supposed to be playing elite agents, SAS, taking down terrorists? Do you need to communicate with your partner when a room's clear? Kind of doesn't make any sense. The only scene in where the protagonist speaks in the missions is near the end of MW3, where you're playing Yuri and Price is yelling at us because apparently we suddenly know Makarov. So trusted you. I thought I could too. So why in bloody hell does Makarov know you? And in retrospect, this reveal feels cheap since there was never any indication of it before. Yuri never spoke about it. Maybe if, you know, some of the early missions he had dropped hands, it might have felt a bit more earned, or maybe the player could have figured it out themselves. But up until this moment, Yuri was just a silent man so that the player could insert themselves into the game. Even so, he plays an MW1, definitely has a lot of banter with Price in the later games. So, try not to die this time. <laughs> you worry about yourself. But doesn't say a word when he's in the player's control. It's so jarring and gives the old game such minimal opportunity to actually build these characters that they become so iconic. The characters in the old game have very little depth and honestly 12 years later they kind of just feel flat. Because of the silent protagonist most of the time, what your character does when you're in the hot seat is walk forward, listen to instructions and shoot bad guys. And that's fine if that's your thing, I'm not gonna yuck your yum. But considering how much everybody loves the character banter in the reboot series, it feels like a really weird choice. Two goldfish are in a tank. Go on. One turns to the other and says, You know how to drive this thing. Little army humor? Very little. LT, I'm at the bar. You like tequila? Could use one right about now. I'd murder for a whiskey. You mean scotch? I drink bourbon. Like a good old boy. I love Kentucky. You're out of your mind, LT. That's for sure. It just feeds into the idea that Call of Duty in the old days was just aimed at the male audience who wanted to live out the fantasy of being a super buff military man who kicked the bad guy's ass, and there was not much more to it than that. The original trilogy features count them two female characters of significance. And when I say significance, I mean they actually spoke and the player kind of interacted with them. The first is this female pilot from Modern Warfare 1 that you have to pull out of a jet that gets shot down. And the second is in Modern Warfare 3 and this is Elena, the Russian president's daughter, who serves as the classic damsel in distress who needs to be saved so her dad doesn't give the nuclear launch codes to the Makarov. More male power fantasy. The original narrative also kind of gets crazy escalation. In Modern Warfare 1, the bad guys are already dropping nukes on us. When we get to Modern Warfare 2 and 3, they escalate the threat level by adding more nukes. Okay, sure, but you can see how I really didn't get that much room to play with when they've already kind of dumped the worst possible outcome on top of us already. And so it's kind of like, where do you go to up the ante and urgency in MW2 and 3? It doesn't really feel like escalation, but rather the narrative has gone from within the realm of probability to just crazy ridiculousness. Again, more male power fantasy stuff here. Now that being said, don't get me wrong, the new COD series definitely has plenty for the boys who want to live out their male power fantasy. You still shoot guns that make nice bang sounds, launch rockets, snipe assholes from across the field and save the day. 
However, come on lads, you have to admit, it was much better when there was a bit of female gaze added in, eh? You don't get it? Let's roll some clips. The first time we meet Captain Price in the original MW1, we meet him for training and he says this. It's the FNG, sir. Go easy on him, sir. It's his first day in the regiment. Right. What the hell kind of name is Sophie? How a muffin like you pass selection? Now, this line is iconic because it's just a great piece of dialogue, but the scenario that follows is us just running around doing some training. The game assumes that we don't know how to play and must be taught when to throw grenades and check our corners. I thought we'd already been selected for the SAS. Why do we need to go through this tutorial? Contrast that with the reboot. What's different here is Price saves our ass from getting shanked, walks over and assumes that we're capable after we affirm that indeed we have a weapon and teams up with us to deal with the guy strapped to the bomb. The game doesn't have to tell us how to play. We already know how to point and shoot and I think that's infinitely better than us having to run a practice course to show us the controls. And the fact that the actual character, Captain Price, also believes that we're good enough to team up with him, the GOAT, is a way better power fantasy and it also brings this idea about character and prize and personality and being able to pick up in each other's capabilities. You know, I'm the first guy to ever get to physically move him, so I had to find a way to make this guy real and, and believable and, and a guy for who can work in a 2019 scenario. Above all else, he is a protector and he is a guide but I wanted to make sure that in every scene I'm checking in on the person that I'm with. But I tried to make this price be someone who you would aspire to be. That's female gaze. Also, just an aside, only this man could make dusting off his hat this appealing. I'm sorry, take notes, boys. It's not about being exposed, your muscles out. It's like the small minute things. The new price character is different to when we last saw him. After reviewing the original trilogy, you could argue that the player was never the protagonist, rather that it was Price. Through the eyes of every other character, he gets the most amount of development in the story. The series even ends with Price killing Makarov in the end and lighting up his iconic cigar. In the reboot, he has about the same amount of effect on the story as all the other main characters. To Gaz and Farah, he acts as a mentor and supportive figure. He sees how frustrated Gaz has become and takes him under his wing. He sees potential in him. Most of the time, they're pet up and Price teaches Gaz some hard this? lessons about what it is to do their jobs in the modern Come world. On. Wherever you need it, soldier. End of the day, someone has to make the enemy scared of the dark. I think if one specific character is supposed to embody the player's perspective, it would be Gaz. He does end up in the dumbest and most fun to play situations. <laughs> To Soap and Ghost, Price is their leader and captain. We don't get to see too much of the dynamic between Price, Soap and Ghost in MW2 The Reboot. I hope they expand on the relationship in Modern Warfare 3. It's clear that Price respects Soap and Ghost as he had the first members that he recruits into Task Force 141. Ghost is trusted enough to lead operations in Price's stead, so that means something. And to Laswell, Price is the trusted colleague and friend, perhaps outside of work. They constantly challenge each other in the story, but always want to do what is right. They just have different ways of getting from point A to point B. We can observe the female gaze in play through the eyes of Farah. She is a leader of a group of freedom fighters and has been fighting oppression in her country for almost all her life. We play through her childhood and the loss of her father at the hands of the Russians. 
We see her evolve as she gets older, saving her entire group from General Barkov's prison by successfully passing a message to some allies. Price offers her and her brother some advice about the high ground of war, which she takes to heart. I know he's gonna make you pay for this. We will make them pay. We'll be ready. My men have cleared the road to the north. You can camp there, it's safe. Thank you. The revolution begins now, sister. The war begins now, brother. Even war is a high ground. My brother Hadir, on the other hand, has other ideas as we discover later. When she and Price meet later in the series, he continues to treat her with respect and often defers to her on what to do next, which makes sense since they're fighting on her home turf. He stands up for her later when it is revealed that her freedom fighters have been put on the list of foreign terror organizations, which is bull by the way! We see the world through her eyes and witness the cruelty that her people are subject to. And she decides to fight back! Through her entire story in 1 she expresses her own agency and looks back at the world around her. This is her personal female gaze in action. The dynamic she and Alex have is excellent and one of mutual respect. It would have been really easy for the writers to shoehorn a romance in between the two, but they don't, and that's refreshing. I loved that about her, and I mm. loved that that was the route that they took. And you know, they don't have they don't have time to be they don't have time for romance, really. Essentially, in this, no. like, I remember thinking that from Farrah's headspace. I was like, "What do you mean? She has no time for this." Yeah. What, do you, what do you think? She's like brushing off her AK and then like hopping on Tinder. Like it's not <laughs> like she's not, there's no time for this. <laughs> yeah. They over the course of the campaign surprise each other. Barrow challenges Alex about his worldviews about what he's fighting for. And he in turn offers her support and loyalty, which is rare for her to see from outsiders. And you, where will you go when this is over? Wherever they send me. You don't choose. <laughs> Not exactly. These characters in the end have become close to each other and it's believable. They go through much together. Watch how Farrah looks at him here. She's like, this guy's crazy, but I guess I am a little bit too. The next point is an aside, but I was really relieved when they chose not to show any R word happening to Farah when she was in Barkov's prison. This trope in media is generally unnecessary. <laughs> the female gaze is not just expressed visually. Some of you out there may have seen the trend on TikTok a while back of women acting like they're written by men. Now, while as far as I'm aware, none of the writing stuff for the Modern Warfare games are women, that doesn't mean they cannot write for the female gaze. When we first meet Ghost, he begins as a lone wolf agent, working to take down the leader of Kutzfors. We get an impression of his character. Rugged, military man, strong, works alone, classic archetype. And right after this, he's forced to work in a team with Soap, and is clearly not f***ing happy. Let's get ourselves a win, yeah, LT? Save your seat, sir. Ghost, you copy? Yes, sir. Any issues? Negative, sir. Over time, we see the boys get closer, and after going through a number of trials together, the characters grow. Ghost teaches so about the hard choices one needs to make in war. So he was here. Lost him when we secured the crash site. Are you saying we shouldn't have helped? Choices have consequences. Soap, in turn, earns his respect over time, even if he doesn't quite realize it himself. For whatever reason, you know, it doesn't need to be talked about now, but, um, but, but Ghost, Ghost has, but it's clear that Ghost has a huge amount of respect for Soap, right? And that, yeah. so that, that he wouldn't let anybody, in fact, for anybody else to talk to him the way Soap does would mean a different thing, mm -hmm. but they've been through a lot together. This all pays off in the mission alone. Solid. Before we lost you. The boys are separated in Las Almas after being betrayed by Graves and Shadow Company. Soap is wounded and needs help. Ghost teaches him how to make improvised weapons and traps out of things easily found in the city. The banter we get to hear for the mission finally allows the boys to get to know each other a bit better. Show my face. Yes, sir. Negative. Are you ugly? Quite the opposite. This also finally humanizes Ghost, 
through all the dark and witty jokes that he makes. You find ways to get through it mm -hmm. through humor. It's like such yeah. a vital human need to laugh. And I think that's why it works because it feels real and it's universal and people get it. It's why like people make jokes at funerals and during tragedy, it's like, it's a, it's a real thing. Guys, come on. You're telling me they did not know precisely what they were doing. Oh, hello. Just making sure my TikTok elves are behaving themselves. They knew which audience they wanted to appeal to, the girls and the gays, bro. Soap makes it to the church and they eventually can get the hell out of Los Alamos. Soap still has the impression that Ghost would have left him behind, but Ghost is quick to correct this. Where were you guys? On the run. I was on the run. Ghost waited for me. Of course, no? No. Yes. We're a team. All of us. This happened on my watch and I'll need help to fix it. No one fights alone. He has learned that sometimes you need a team. You can't do everything on your own. The boys grow closer. You know, they're, they're pushing each other to evolve, right? Without even realizing it. For Soap to say something like that costs something for him and, and mm. for, for Ghost to correct the record and say what he says, that costs something too. And I think, again, like, that's why this game's so satisfying is these characters are they're going to places they've not been before, but they help each other get there. And I think that's a good, you know, that's a good theme that's come out during this game is that, you know, that they need each other. Another side tangent, boys. If you want to know why all the girlies are losing their goddamn minds of a ghost it's the eyes the mask is extra spies we look into his eyes and we wonder about the stories they could tell and what they've seen it's another big thing for the female gaze we wonder what these characters are like and enjoy speculating about the parts the writers do not implicitly tell us ghost fits that to a t why does he wear the mask how long has he been fighting does he have any family questions just go on and on all right, now we're going to talk about Laswell. She did not feature in the original series, and she's a welcome addition. We see a different kind of female character expressing agency through her story. A woman who's had to rise the ranks in an industry dominated by males. I honestly personally relate to this. Not to get into what my IRL job is, but anyone who's a woman and works in the tech industry can relate and knows this feeling. This is why when we see Lazarus talking to generals, the captain, making big diplomatic moves all around the world and is being treated with respect, it's just awesome. The bands between her and Price and Gaz are top tier. How did you and Captain Price meet, Lazarus? I like street food. John and I met at a falafel stand in Lebanon. Seriously? No. It was an airport bar in Lisbon. For real now? She's pulling your legs, Sergeant. All right, you can both piss off. I need one to know now. Suit yourself. You're missing out, Gaz. It was actually quite pedestrian. Also, she's gay and has a wife. F this queer representation in my Call of Duty wins. What the f we didn't all run cross country in college, Kate. I still run, John. Just gotta stop smoking. You smoke, Laswell. I do. My wife hates it. The way this is revealed to us is perfect. Laswell bringing up her wife and talking about how she wants to stop smoking is the same way a cis man would speak about his wife. It's not a big deal and it's just normal. I can't speak for the queer experience myself in a meaningful way since I don't have that life experience, but this seems like a great step in the right direction for a franchise that previously would never have entertained this idea at all. Also, they let her beat the shit out of this guy, and that's pretty sick. He does end up getting captured after a mission goes wrong, but she makes sure to have the last laugh for sure. Valeria and Alejandro's dynamic allows us to see the female gaze from the point of view on the baddies. The leader of a Mexican cartel, Valeria has had to fight and take all the power that she has in this world. She and Alejandro used to serve together, but clearly had different ideas about what it meant to keep the people of Las Almas safe. She also has an excellent ruse to solidify her power. She created the moniker of El Sinombre, a name that would strike fear into the hearts of anyone who would dare to oppose her. El Sinombre. El Sinombre. The nameless. The leader of the Las Almas Cartel. Where can we find him? You can't. No one knows who he is. But he is everywhere. And this is a challenge. <laughs> Los Vaqueros like challenges. No one would suspect Elsa Nombre was a woman. This challenges the world's male gaze. 
Head of a group of narcos? Must be some asshole guy, right? No, it's just a f***ing smart lady. Don't get me wrong, she's still definitely a criminal. But all her reasons for acting in the way that she does make sense, even if she has to spell it out for our big beefy boys. Terrorism is good for business. It's insurance. What the f does that mean? Puedes sacar la puta cabeza del culo por un segundo! Puta madre, Alejandro! As long as there is a war on terror, there will be no real war on drugs. Also, we all read the room correctly. There definitely was supposed to be sexual tension between her and Alejandro, and I'm here for it. Uh, was Valeria and Al Alejandro ex-lovers? <laughs> I love that they say that. And, you know, I kind of, I think that without even, like, mentioning it, we kind of developed that underlying sexual tension that people are seeing. But I do want to believe, and I did play it so that there was some sort of, I don't know, if, like romance, but definitely sexual tension. I'm pretty sure something happened between There's them. There's a history. And Come on. There, there has to be. There mm. has to be. Mm. I mean, the way the scenes are written and the way that we played them and the way that they came out, there's <clears throat> definitely extra tension that goes, you know, beyond pure, you know, uh, oh, she, betrayal, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah. has to be. But I don't know. Maybe... Maybe they develop something later. I mean, uh, I let's no hope idea. so. Let's hope so, Maria. I don't know what's gonna happen. But, but yeah, there's there's definitely uh, <laughs> you know there's definitely something going on there for sure. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely a lot of emotion, a lot of fire within Alejandro. It just makes that backstory juicier, and we all wonder what the hell went down back in the day. Allowing the characters to have some depth to them attracts a new audience of people who enjoy viewing from the female gaze. But that doesn't mean that it's the only group that the game caters to. We still have our shooting gallery sections, bombastic missions and boss battles to satisfy all the true hardcore gamers out there. But just looking at the narrative, we can clearly see that the team have made an effort for it to appeal to more folks than the original audience. The old series I would describe as a standard fair military shooter that has an ever escalating story to match the crazy and unrealistic set pieces it's showing us. Thinking back to the context of the time we lived in back in 2009, the war in Iraq and so on, yeah, it did feel very propagandary for the US military, but I'm not gonna get into that in this video. Don't get me wrong, the reboot has the same kind of problems, but I'd say it's not nearly so obvious. The new series reflects the current world we live in today and is more of a political thriller than anything else. We have seen with recent events just how close things can be to escalating to an all-out catastrophe and how hard we need to work to ensure that mutually assured destruction is not the end game. Who else themselves when this happened? Because I did. The female gaze is obviously not the only valid way media should be made. Every filmmaker, narrative designer, writer has their own gaze. I suppose the entire point taken in this video is that by caring to multiple different audiences, Modern Warfare's story is better than it's ever been. These are the best versions of the characters we've seen to date, and it shows. I feel like we've gotten to know these iconic characters on a level we have never known before. Listen, just because the girlies and the gays are into it now doesn't mean the cis gamer boys should feel threatened. Don't fumble the bag for the love of God. Oi, gamer boy, who's listening? Do you want a cute e-girl, e-boy, e-n-b, whatever you're into? Okay, here's some f***ing advice. Listen up, listen up. STOP GATEKEEPING THE THINGS THEY LIKE! STOP BEING A As someone who met their IRL husband playing the original Modern Warfare 2 on Xbox Live back in the day Dude. IF YOU'RE NICE TO PEOPLE ONLINE THEY MIGHT ACTUALLY WANT TO BE NICE BACK! Literally bro, just be normal, it's not that hard Shut your goofy ass up and go back to the kitchen, you're 35, go make your kid a sandwich <laughs> I'm going to f your dad and give him a child he actually loves. Also, to everyone whining that people are sexualizing ghosts and being mad about it, bro, shut the hell up. I'm just gonna put some female characters on the screen. I know you've been on the hub and enjoyed watching these ladies being I don't wanna hear about it, bro, and it goes both ways. And again, stop fumbling the bag. All those TikTok edits that you think are cringe? Bro, the girlies are showing you what they're like! Are you dumb? Take notes! Also, 
it's not like it's just the girlies and the gays. Your boys like them too. You just won't admit it. This is illegal. You are a prisoner of war. God, that voice, man. That that voice could seduce me. No, I don't understand how you are like laughing at his voice. is so nice. I love the accent. Like, shut the f up. Don't laugh. What was that about? Oh my God, my hard. I can be very persuasive. Yes, mommy. A women in charge does things to me. Uh, what? Back to the main point here. Attracting a new audience is a good thing. Diversity makes all products and media better. Seeing different gazes used in film and media is a good thing. It just makes the narratives we get to see better. Stop complaining, gamer boys. Letting more people into the fold will just make the games you play more good, better, nicer, sicker. Don't you just want more fun games with great story? Yes? Good. Now please, for the love of God, stop telling us to get back in the kitchen. Ah! So this next part here is for the people who still don't f***ing get it. I'm going to talk about all the characters and exactly what tropes they hit on that the girlies like, just to really spell it out for the Gamer Boys. Please see this handy dandy chart. Truly, you have a wonderful buffet table. Whatever you're into, the Modern Warfare cast can satisfy. Let's start here. First up, we got Ghost. He's for the I can fix him slash helps him type of lady. Angst, trauma, vibes, enemies to lovers, feels. Baba girl, big boy, voice, mask is extra spice. Soap, wholesome energy, cute and flirty, Scotland forever. And he's just a big kid. Gaz is your resident Zuma, cheeky bugger. Not broken by war yet. Price. Daddy. Oh my god, the voice. I cannot with the voice, guys. Handlebars so you can hold on for dear life. Charming. Definitely take you out at a romantic candlelit dinner. Cigars for the win. Also, ladies um, on AO3, you're f***ing sleeping on this man. Okay, I'm up. I'm upset. Hold on. I need to I need to show you guys something. Alright. I need to I need to look at some raw numbers here. Hold on. Video games. C. Call of Duty. Call of Duty. Alright, hold up. Simon Ghost Riley Reader, 789. Okay. John Price, Call of Duty Reader, Sort and Filter. 138! This is not enough! Ah! I f***ing read all of these already. I need more! Ah! <laughs> Next up, Alejandro. Charming, but you know, in like that Spanish way, you know what I'm talking about? Would save you from a house fire. Would flirt with you at every given occasion. And you will know Spanish when he is up. Next up, Graves. F***ing cringe. Okay, I don't. F oh, I don't get this one. Okay, but sure, maybe he got some southern charm. Definitely calls you babe doll. There'd be lots of angst. He'd probably cheat on you. F***ing cringe. Okay, fucking cringe. I don't like him. Alex, golden retriever energy. Would be friends to lovers vibes. Call you man. Apparently he's not f***ing dead. <laughs> Nikolai. All right. Not many, I don't think there's many Nikolai Sims, but look, he's a funny guy. Comedic relief. Old dog. That's what he is. Sergeant Garrick. Package is in the back. What is it? Truth serum. <laughs> we got it. It's hard to run with concussion, no? Valeria. Kato Mummy. Definitely goes both ways. Ruthless as f would totally steal you from Alejandro in a love triangle. Just saying. Farah, sister I'd like to f woman in charge. Slow ass burn, if anything ever happens. Probs never kiss, cause she's too busy being a freedom fighter. Laswell, MILF, gay as f smokes, runs, strong lady. <laughs> and finally, Rodolfo, soft boy. He'd be the most tender and loving, treats you right, but I feel like he has the always the bridesmaid but never the bride syndrome, you know? Yeah, that's how I feel about that. By the way, guys, if you are perhaps into taking orders and getting praise, look, man, I don't know what to tell you. They put so much of that in this game. Solid copy. Good work. Get your gun on that tree line. Good shot. So, keep us covered. Bring me down. Good work, Sergeant. Uh, uh, dropped one. Well done, mate. Shut your mouth. Follow me. All right. I think I have waffled on this take long enough. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. If you like this video, let me know. This is the first time I've made this type of content and Ed is the son and I worked really hard on it. So I'd love to get some feedback. As always, if you like what you see, make sure to like and subscribe. See you next time for my next crazy long take on video games. <laughs> Bye.